Thank you for the kind invitation, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you to my students that are also here. I really <laughs> feel touched by this. OK, so what I'm going to tell you is um, I came to New York around 10 years ago with the idea of uh, staying in the States for two years and going back. And things uh, went so well that I decided to stay. So um, let me share with you um, the dream that I've, I've been following and for the last 10 years. <coughs> Recurring miscarriage is a serious and sad thing. Um, around 2,000 couples, 200,000 couples per year suffer from recurrent miscarriages. And unfortunately, the standard uh, investigations fail to find uh, a cause for these uh, spontaneous abortions. So despite aggressive attempts to understand the mechanism behind fetal rejection, um, neither the incidence nor the treatment uh, of this disease has changed substantially in the last three decades. So, um, oh, the picture is not there. I'm so sorry. What's going on? Okay, there was a picture there to show you that uh, my goal actually and my dream was to find a treatment, to find a, uh, to find a mechanism and targets for therapy to prevent uh, recurrent miscarriages. So that's what we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years. So um, first I have to talk a little about what is lupus, because uh, as I'm going to show you, I've been working these past 10 years in animal models of pregnancy loss. And one of these animal models is induced by autoantibodies. And if we talk about autoantibodies, we need to talk a little about lupus. And lupus is a chronic autoimmune disorder. It's mostly, it's mostly a women's disease, actually. For every man that develops lupus, nine women develop the disease. It's frequently observed in women in their childbearing years. And people of color, Afro-American people, Latinos, Asian, and Native American, develop lupus three to four times more often than Caucasian people. And the number of people that have lupus in the United States is between half to two million. So if we are going to talk about our immune disease, we need to know a little about what our immune system, our immune system is and what are our immune cells. So uh, we have a body immune cell that actually the aim is to protect us from invading pathogens. So this immune system in a, that normally defends us in a person with lupus uh, really gets uh, what is called hyperactive and start forming antibodies. These are the B cells that are the ones that are the guards that are going to uh, produce these antibodies. But unfortunately, these antibodies are going to be directed uh, to their own bodies. So they can really affect uh, normal tissues and organs, including skin, joints, kidneys, brain, heart, lungs, placenta, and blood cells. So one of these kind of antibodies that are producing lupus are called antiphospholipid antibodies. And I want you to pay attention because these are the antibodies that we are going to use in one of our mouse models of pregnancy complications. So what are antiphospholipid antibodies? So they are antibodies that react with phospholipids. Uh, that is a type of molecule that is part of our normal cell membranes. And usually they not only bind to those phospholipids, but, but they bind to a protein on the membrane that is called beta 2 GP1. Why are important? Having antiphospholipid antibodies makes you more susceptible to develop uh, thrombosis, that means increased clotting of the blood, and also miscarriages. So women with high titers of these antibodies, they have recurrent miscarriages. So uh, when we decided to study which are the causes of pregnancy loss, we started doing it in two models, as I told you, one that is antibody dependent and a second one that I'm going to describe the second part of my talk that is not antibody dependent. So in the antibody dependent model, what we did is we isolated these antibodies from patients. Usually these patients, they have very high titers of these antibodies and as they're really harmful, what they do is they go through a process of uh, plasma phoresis. That means their whole blood is filtrated. So we run to the nephrology uh, department to get these bags where those antibodies are. We isolate them and we inject them into pregnant mice. 
So as you can see here, if you inject mice on day 8 and 12 of pregnancy with these antibodies, and day by day 15, we sacrifice the mice and we dissect the uterus. We also use other antibodies, so the ones that we isolate from patients are called polyclonal antibodies. We also use monoclonal antibodies that are grown in the lab. We have cell cultures, they are called hybridomas, that are able to secrete these antiphospholipid antibodies in just flask in the incubator. So what happened? By day 15 of pregnancy, those mice that receive the antiphospholipid antibodies, they develop pregnancy loss. So in the top panel, you can see the uterus in a mouse is like a Y. It has two horns. So actually, you can see the left and the right horn over there. So in the top panel, there's a mouse that has been treated with control antibodies. Those are immunoglobulins that actually maintain from healthy volunteers. That means ourselves in the lab. And uh, the two other panels are the ones that are injected with APL that we isolate from patients or we grow in the lab. And as you can see here, here, and the arrows are pointing there, those black round spheres are embryos that are being absorbed, are uh, fetuses that are not going to make it. And if you look at the surviving ones, they are also smaller than the control. And that's a pathology that is called intrauterine growth restriction. And it's uh, pretty serious. Even, I mean, they can die, but they're going to pay a, a big toll in adult life because whatever is lacking in uterus during pregnancy it has been described that being growth restricted predisposes you in adult life to serious metabolic diseases, autoimmune diseases, and also so heart disease. So even the ones that survive are going to have some health problems in the future. So if we think about a pregnancy, I mean, it is a fascinating thing, but if you think it from the immune point of view, um, a pregnancy is not different from receiving a transplant from an individual that is genetically different from the mother. So uh, the mammalian embryo actually is like a tissue transplant, and that, cons that makes uh, pregnancy a unique immunological challenge. The mother has to tolerate those antigens in order for the pregnancy to go to term. So if we think, uh, I've been working in kidneys for many years before working in pregnancy, and especially in kidney transplants, and one of the reactions when you have a, a kidney graft that is not really responding, you have a lot of reactions that actually makes you think that there are some immune reactions that are shared between a, a transplant that is rejected and a pregnancy that doesn't go well. So one of these uh, uh, immune reactions that happens in, in a, when an a organ transplant fails is the activation of the complement system. The complement system is part of our immune innate system. And you remember those little guys, the B cells? So those are part of our immune system, innate immune system. And the complement system is one of the weapons that those uh, cells are going to use to destroy the invaders. So there are three activation pathways. I don't want to, it's called a cascade because that's what it is. One molecule activates the next one and the next one, the following one. But there are two effector mechanism, how the complement cascade defend ourselves. So first is by releasing, I want you to pay attention because it's going to be a molecule that I'm going to talk about. It's called C5A. It's a chemical mediator that brings in a lot of inflammatory cells. And these inflammatory cells can then eat up the pathogen that is trying to attack us. But if it's that the immune system is turning against your own tissue, those inflammatory cells can also affect your own tissue. And the other mechanism, besides releasing that important, is called anaphylotoxin. That's the chemical mediator that calls the neutrophils to go in, the, all the inflammatory cells. It's called the MAC, or membrane attack complex, that actually all these protein of the complement system, they make like a pore, a hole in the membrane. So the membrane just lies and they die. So those are the two mechanisms that the complement system use to fight pathogens. But these complement components increase during transplant rejection. So we thought that maybe complement has something to do with fetal rejection, especially because we know that an appropriate complement inhibition is an absolute required for a successful pregnancy. And actually, the fetomaternal interface is extremely rich in complement inhibitors. So that means that 
complement has to be under control in order for the pregnancy to go to term. So based on these results, and also because they tried to knock out these proteins actually, and the mice did not survive, showing how important are they in pregnancy. So they, they were not viable. So we wanted to know if really com the complement system was involved in this fetal injury in our model of pregnancy loss induced by antiphospholipid antibodies. So what we did is we cut these embryos trying to find out if there was complement deposition there as it is in the transplants that are rejected. And so in the first panel is a control mouse. You can see what it reads E is the embryo. So it's a normal and well-developed embryo. And in the lower panel is the same for C3. You can see that there's a little brown in an area that is called the ectoplacental cone. That's where the placenta is going to be forming. This is day 8.5. The placenta is still not working until day 10 in a mouse. And in the APL1, that I, that's the one I want you to pay attention, there are a lot of embryo debris. There's not a well-preserved embryo. And all those little dots actually are inflammatory cells. And when we identify them, we found that they were neutrophils. So there was inflammation surrounding those dying embryos. And there was a lot of the brown staining in the second panel. That's complement deposition. So that's what was observed also in uh, organ rejection. So uh, I don't have time, but this was like the work of the first four years of this story. But we've been, thank you to the, all the complement biologists, I, I would say, around the world, they were very generous, giving us all kind of mice that are deficient in complement components and also antibodies and peptides to block each of the components of this cascade to see if they are responsible or not for fetal injury. We identified C5A and the interaction with their receptor. The receptors are uh, present in all these inflammatory cells as crucial. We find that, uh, for those of you that you don't know what a knockout mouse is, so mice have been important to study as, as models of human disease, especially because they can be genetically manipulated. So in this case, they, they take the gene or they silence the gene of certain proteins, so they do not express the, the protein. So we found that actually mice that do not have the receptors to C5A, so that means that even if C5A is produced, these inflammatory cells are kind of deaf, they don't really hear the C5A calling them, and when we also deplete the neutrophils with monoclonal antibodies, we protected the pregnancies. As you can see there, there are no reabsorptions in a mouse that does not have C5A receptor. And when there are no neutrophils, the pregnancies are normal too. So this was uh, an interesting time uh, because actually our results pointed to inflammation as the cause of pregnancy loss. And as I told you, antiphospholipid antibodies are uh, Procoagulant, they are thrombogenic. These people, they also have stroke. Rheumatologists, that are the people that, the, the doctors that study autoimmune disease, were not really happy with these new ideas that uh, was inflammation what was, calling the, what was causing the death of the embryos instead of clots in the placentas. Because before, prior to our studies, uh, it was supposed that the babies were dying because there were these clots in the placentas that would not allow enough food and oxygen to get to the embryos. So uh, even more, uh, the neutrophils were not found in those placentas, but actually I always say that you find what you're looking for. So after our results, a lot of people started looking for them and I'm happy to say that actually the biopsies of these women now show a lot of inflammatory cells. So the main culprits of this story are the neutrophils. So here we have a neutrophil that actually in response to this mediator C5A of the complement cascade, is capable of releasing all these enzymes and oxidative substances that really are going to induce cell injury and inflammation. And we are going to see how we got to this. Moreover, these women, as I told you, it was supposed that the babies were dying because of thrombosis, because of clots in the placenta. So the regular treatment for these women actually is anticoagulation, it's heparin. These women had to inject themselves with subcutaneous doses of heparin in their belly every day during their pregnancy. But, uh, so, but we started looking in the literature and 
we said, okay, maybe heparin is, and, and, and it works sometimes, it has a lot of side effects like uh, bleeding if you don't really control the dose, and it also induces osteoporosis, plus the complaint of these women injecting themselves every day. Um, so we decided to study the effect of heparin in our mouse model, but with another hypothesis. We thought that maybe heparin was not acting as a procoagulant molecule inducing thrombosis, but maybe it was stopping the complement cascade that I showed, and it was working as an anti-inflammatory molecule. So we thought that actually maybe it was the right treatment, but it was used for the wrong reason. And this was a study that we published in Nature Medicine in 2004, where we found, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by this big table, I'm going to walk you through it to uh, just spot what is important. So what we found is that there was a good pregnancy outcomes when we were treating mice with anticoagulants that they were also anti-inflammatory. But what was interesting me was that even the dose of heparin that was not anticoagulant, we make tests in blood and see that it was too little to really anticoagulate, it did prevent pregnancy loss by inhibiting complement. We also tried other anticoagulants that were not complement inhibitors and actually they did not prevent pregnancy loss. So that shows you that anticoagulation is not enough to prevent pregnancy loss in this model. Moreover, we tried aspirin. Aspirin is the other treatment that these women receive. It's called LDA or low-dose low aspirin. And we found that aspirin actually did not inhibit complement and did not prevent miscarriages. So here we are. It's inflammation or thrombosis. So that's why we started thinking about a potential molecule that could be the one responsible for the maybe crosstalk between inflammation and thrombosis and trying to correlate uh, our mouse studies with the clinical field. So um, tissue factor is a protein of the uh, coagulation cascade. So tissue factor is expressed in our bacterial cells, so every time that you cut yourself, tissue factor is expre it's, uh, expressed and is, it activates the coagulation to create what is called a hemostatic plug or a clot to prevent bleeding. So one of the effects is binding all these, com these coagulation proteins, that's why it's called also the uh, coagulation cascade, and induce thrombosis. But lately, there have been a lot of studies showing that tissue factor can also be a pro-inflammatory molecule through the interaction with a set of receptors that are called protease activate receptors, and they can induce inflammation. But most of these uh, proteins in the coagulation cascade are serine proteases, so they can really activate this group of receptors that are called PARS and induce inflammation. So what was to do next? to find if there was tissue factor in these embryos that were dying. So when we stain for tissue factor in the one that is from a mouse, it's a deceit, well, that's the uterine content of a mouse treated with APL, we saw again embryo debris, the pieces of, of embryo, and a very robust staining for tissue factor, while in the one that was treated with normal human IgG, that's the, the immunoglobulins of the volunteers in the lab, uh, did not induce tissue factor expression, only a little in the placenta, and the placenta actually is very rich in tissue factor because it has a purpose, and it prevents bleeding during pregnancy. And we did a blot to show that what we, the colors we were seeing under the microscope uh, are reliable, and the band in the middle shows that there's more tissue factor uh, expression in, in the APL one. What was interesting is that for tissue factor to behave as a procoagulant molecule to activate the coagulation cascade, I should see more fibrin. Fibrin is the end stage of this plug, hemostatic plug that I, I told you before, but we did not see any increase in fibrin in those embryos. We were seeing increased tissue factor, but we did not see actually clots. We've been looking for years for these clots, looking in old uh, books of histochemistry, trying to find all kind of different uh, stainings for fibrin monoclonal antibodies, and we could never find increased fibrin or clots in those placentas or deciduous. So the absence of fibrin deposition and thrombi actually suggests that tissue factor is not as acting as a procoagulant inducing thrombosis, but maybe 
it can be acting by another way. So what we did next is, okay, we found this increased tissue factor expression, but is it crucial to pregnancy loss? To, to prove that, we used two strategies. We tried to diminish tissue factor in mice by using a monoclonal antibody, and also we use mice that are deficient in tissue factor. So when we use this monoclonal antibody called uh, H1, uh, 1H1, we found that, do you remember the picture I showed you? Around 40% of the embryos after an APL injection die. So there you can see the tall gray bar. That's the 40% of the embryos that are not going to make it. And in a control mouse, around one out of 10 is reabsorbed and it's mainly a question of space. When we give them the, uh, that's the gray bar in the normal human IgG, when you give, we block tissue factor expression with this antibody, we were able to rescue the pregnancies. It came from 40% to 10% that is not different from the control antibodies. Uh, so that means that by inhibiting tissue factor, we were able to um, have good pregnancies. The second strategy was to use mice that are deficient in tissue factor. The mice that are deficient in tissue factor are null. They do not reproduce. So these are mice that they are null for mouse tissue factor, but they, ex they have a transgene for human tissue factor and they express only 1% of the total amount of tissue factor. And those mice, as the black second bar, were also protected from APL-induced pregnancy loss, showing that tissue factor actually is a crucial mediator of fetal injury in this model. So here we were. APS is what is called the antiphospholipid syndrome. That's the syndrome that is described. These women with recurrent miscarriages, they usually suffer from antiphospholipid syndrome. So we had here quite of a puzzle that we wanted to put together. We knew that C5A was released, that the little molecule that calls in the inflammatory cells. So the inflammatory cells are there, the neutrophils. We know that tissue factor is also overexpressed in these embryos. And we have, as a result, trophoblast injury. So we started little by little to try to put these uh, puzzle pieces together. So the first thing we did is try to connect C5A and C5A and its receptor with the neutrophils and the tissue factor. And we did that by uh, finding that in response to C5A, the neutrophils actually overexpress tissue factor on their surface. So uh, we know that these antiphospholipid antibodies, they bind to the trophoblast. You might be asking why the placenta cells, why are the antiphospholipid antibodies so fond of these kind of cells? The placenta is an organ that is uh, constantly changing, so the cells are growing and acquiring new functions. So these cells are continuously syncytializing and flipping their membranes, exposing phospholipids. That's why the antibodies are really, they go there. When we inject labeled antibodies into a mouse, 30 to 40 minutes later, we don't find it in the blood. And when we cut and stain the placentas, they are all there. So that shows you how uh, how big is the affinity of these antibodies for placental tissue. So these antibodies go to the placenta, they activate the complement cascade. I showed you that using all these knockouts, we found that it's mainly C5A, the component of the complement cascade that is involved with tissue with fetal injury. So C5A calls all these neutrophils, the neutrophils are swimming in our blood, and when they sense this chemotactic molecule, they go to the site of inflammation, in this case is the placenta, and we found that in response to that, the neutrophils express tissue factor. So that was kind of an interesting thing. We found a molecule that is kind of tissue factor for many years was only a coagulation protein and has nothing to do with the neutrophils that is actually mainly inflammation. So maybe tissue factor was the link we were looking in this crosstalk between inflammation and thrombosis. So, moreover, we had this special knockout. It's a mouse that do not express tissue factor only on the neutrophils. And we, we, when we injected tissue, uh, APL, antiphospholipid antibodies, in these mice, actually they did not develop pregnancy loss. And this is the black second bar. So the absence of tissue factor on the neutrophils prevented pregnancy loss. So tissue factor expression on neutrophils it seems to be increasing somehow the neutrophils activity. And that's what we wanted to prove next. 
So what we did is to measure neutrophil activity in uh, neutrophils that overexpress tissue factor in response to APL. And we did flow analysis, that's a method to isolate cells in a machine and see what they express in their surface. And we found that the cells being Cree negative is the strategy to express or not tissue factor on the myeloid cells, on the neutrophils. So we found that the cells are able to release these oxidative substances, it's called oxidative burst, uh, only when there's tissue factor, that's the, the graph that is uh, moved to the right, only when there's tissue factor on the neutrophils. And then we measure phagocytosis. The neutrophils uh, can eat up the pathogens that are trying to invade us by phagocyting them. So phagocytosis is a measurement of neutrophil activity. So we fed the neutrophils these fluorescent beads and see how hungry they were. And we did it, again, in neutrophils that they have tissue factor outside or do not. And we found that the white histogram shows that there's increased phagocytosis induced by antiphospholipid antibodies only when the neutrophils have tissue factor in their membrane. So if the neutrophils are more active because they have tissue factor expression, that does translate into more oxidative damage into the trophoblast, that is what is really going to lead to fetal death. So to do that, we looked at free radical mediated oxidative injury in the trophoblast. So yes, they do induce oxidative stress. We stained the placentas with this fluorescent marker that in the presence of oxidation gives this really bright red. And so this is a, a section from a placenta from an APL-treated mouse. So the bright red color means that there's a lot of oxidative stress going there. So we're relating more aggressive neutrophils that they have tissue factor outside with increased trophoblast injury. And if you compare to an APL, treated mouse that do not have tissue factor on their neutrophils, we found that there's no oxidative damage in those placentas. And that makes sense because those neutrophils are not activated. And those results are comparable to the ones that we observe in a mouse that expresses low tissue factor or the control antibody. So we were able, in a way, to put together these four pieces. And after that, we decided to understand how tissue factor is increasing the activity of the neutrophils. And as I told you, the pro-inflammatory effects of tissue factor can be uh, mediated by these protease-activated receptors. And as you can see, the only part that is short there is the one that corresponds to a mouse that is deficient in part two. That's one of these protease-activated receptors. So DHR, that's the oxidative stress. Over there is the phagocytosis. So there was no increased oxidative stress of phagocytosis in neutrophils from mice that were deficient in this part two, showing that part two signaling is required for these tissue factor pro-inflammatory effects on the neutrophils. So we also found that part two deletion also prevents fetal injury. When we injected mice that are deficient in part two with the antiphospholipid antibodies, we rescued the pregnancies, and we also prevented the oxidative stress. Do you remember the bright red? Well, here is gray. Uh, when we uh, studied a part two deficient mouse, there was no red color, so that means there's no oxidation. So uh, then came this next step in our lives when we um, started reading about the statins, and you might know uh, that statins are drugs that uh, a lot of people use to lower their cholesterol levels, but um, they do not only reduce the cholesterol levels, they have a lot of pleiotropic properties, like inhibition of inflammation and coagulation. And one of the things that statins do is diminish the levels of tissue factor. So if this is a model that is tissue factor mediated, we thought, wow, how about if we give the mice statins? If we can downregulate tissue factor, maybe we can rescue pregnancies. So the next question was, can statin prevent miscarriages in APL-treated mice? So we gave them statins. We started with simvastatin, and we moved to pravastatin because pravastatin is hydrosoluble, so it's not going to get to the embryo. And to our surprise, and we were happy, we'd been smiling for weeks because we couldn't believe that really what we were seeing, by giving them my statins, we prevented fetal uh, injury in mice. 
as you can see there, there are no absorptions and the 40% increase in fetal absorption was not observed when we gave the mice simvastatin. And also another marker of uh, damage is complement deposition, as in an organ rejection. We don't see it when we give the mice simvastatin. And we found that statins actually prevent APL-induced pregnancy loss by downregulating, by diminishing the synthesis of tissue factor and part two. And we found also that it diminished the activation of the neutrophils by downregulating the tissue factor. As you can see here, the reactive oxygen species and the phagocytosis, when we give the mice APL and simvastatin, is uh, different from the mice that receive only APL, that they have higher levels of oxidative stress. And we also were able with statins to prevent the oxidative damage of the placentas. And this is why we prevented miscarriages. So this is a picture to put together the, what we think is going on uh, in the pathophysiology of pregnancy loss. So we think that the neutrophils are crucial. It's an inflammatory disorder. And it has to do with complement activation induced by uh, antiphospholipid antibodies. And in response to this complement activation, the neutrophils express tissue factor. And tissue factor increases the activity. These neutrophils that express tissue factor are more aggressive. They release more oxidative uh, compounds and enzymes. And thus, they induce oxidative damage, trophoblast injury, and fetal death. So now, so this is an article that was telling about the APL studies. So now in the last part of this talk, I'm going to move to the second model that we use. That is a model that is antibody independent and it's called the CBA-DBA model. So this is, uh, let me introduce you this interesting couple. When the mother is a CBAJ and you mate her with the CBA father, everything goes fine. The litter is normal. But when she's mated with the DBA male, she, has, she develops miscarriages. So this is a model of immunologically mediated antibody-independent pregnancy loss that has been studied for many years because it shares many features with human recurrent miscarriages. And lately we found that it's not only a model of miscarriages, but the females later on in pregnancy, they develop preeclampsia that is also a very serious disease of pregnancy characterized by a mother vascular response to the fetus that is being rejected. So here you can see that in this model, 30% of the embryos die in comparison to all of the other matings. And the asterisk showed you the embryos that are being reabsorbed. This is a model that is also characterized by complement activation. When we found, when we stained for complement deposition, we found increased complement deposition. And you can read the anti-F480. That's a marker for another inflammatory cells that are the macrophages. So there are other cells that also are part of our immune system and are there to defend us. So those cells, they travel to the decidua in response to complement activation. In this model, what we found was something amazing. Actually, um, I came up with this idea about measuring angiogenic factor after seeing an interesting talk of Jude Falkman. He was describing how a tumor was growing. And I was sitting there and I was like, I couldn't believe how similar are the mechanisms of a baby to grow and a tumor to grow. So I left the, the, the kind of embarrass of thinking that I said, well, maybe a baby is a good tumor, but actually they use the same systems. So to grow a tumor needs to develop blood vessels and a baby, that's what it needs. So this angiogenic means they are going to generate angio blood vessels. So we measured these angiogenic factors in this model that have pregnancy complications. And we found actually that there's an increase in an anti-angiogenic molecule. That molecule is called soluble fluid one. And it's a molecule that sequesters growth factors called VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor that are necessary for the formation of new blood vessels. So we found that actually the macrophages that are infiltrating that are called to the decidua because of C5A, they are the ones that release these anti-angiogenic molecules. And so what they are doing is they are diminishing the levels of this factor that is necessary for blood formation. So there's an, there's a, there are no blood vessels, they are less, and so there's this inadequate placental perfusion, fetal death, and growth restriction in this model. 
So this is what happens when there's no BGF. BGF you need for a, a process that is called spiral uh, remodelation. So th this remodeling has to do with the placenta, that is this foreign tissue, has to invade the maternal tissue in order to create big blood vessels to pump a lot of blood. And actually, this is a price that we are paying to grow bigger brains because you need a lot of blood flow in order to, and that's why this kind of disease is affected by angiogenesis defects, has to do is preclamps, and it's a disease that actually affects mainly uh, human. Um, so preeclampsia is this uh, uh, not a normal formation of blood vessels, so it brings hypoxia and then the placenta gets ischemic and the baby dies. So we looked in this model for other features of preeclampsia and we found them. These women, they have a renal compromise, they release albumin in their urine. You can see there the black dots, that's albumin in the urine. They have a kidney lesion that is characteristic and it's called endotheliosis. It's an inflammation of those cells. You can see here a big swollen cell. And uh, even if you don't know anything about a uh, kidney, you can see the wide open lumen in the control mouse. And this one, the lumen, that's where the, the blood is filtered to form urine. It can do it because it's all clumped. So we found that lesion in these mice. And these women with preeclampsia, they develop hypertension. So that's, a, oh, I don't see here my two students that are helping me now in the lab uh, to measure the blood pressure in, in, in mice. And we found that actually these mice that have uh, recurrent miscarriages and they have these signs of preeclampsia, they also have hypertension that develops around day nine of pregnancy. There's also an increased oxidative stress in these mice and we did it by measuring uh, an oxidative dairy bait that is called STAT-8, that is an isoprostane, that also is a vasoconstrictor. It increases your blood pressure. And we also measure for the with the same method I showed you before, this fluorescent probe to look for oxidative stress in those placentas. So this mice, the CBA-DBA, is a model of preeclampsia and also fetal absorption. So we wanted to know in this model if it's really tissue factor also was playing a role. So what we did is, we um, look for tissue factor expression, and the top panel is the mice that they have pregnancy problems. And we found increased tissue factor in the labyrinth, that's the part where the ex massive exchange of nutrients occur between the mother and the fetus. There's a lot of fibrin, so here there's some sort of clotting component involved. We measure placental flow, and as you if you can compare it, the green fluorescent staining with the control, the placenta blood flow is reduced in this model, and at the same time, there's more oxidative stress in those placentas compared to the control mice. And when we measure pregnancy outcomes, we found that the babies, the fetuses of the CBA-DBA model, they are really growth restricted. You can see how immature and small are in comparison to the bald C. We did some clinical studies, and we found placentas from women from, with preeclampsia, and we were happy to see the correlations. You always work in a mouse model with the dream of translating those results into the women's world, and we found that actually placenta from patients with uh, preeclampsia, they have increased expression of tissue factor. It's the green fluorescent stain in comparison to the control. So um, if tissue factor is really a crucial mediator, uh, can we prevent pregnancy loss in this model also with statins. So that was our next step. And when we give statins to these mice, the CBA mother made it with the DBA father that have pregnancy loss and preeclampsia, we were able to prevent pregnancy loss and we were also able to prevent intrauterine growth restriction. The surviving fetuses are much bigger. So they are not going to have these complications in later life. And with pravastatin, we were also able to prevent tissue factor expression in the labyrinth of the placenta, and we also prevented oxidative stress. We also prevented the diminution in the blood flow with pravastatin. So that way, by increasing the flow of blood, we, uh, these babies are going to get more oxygen and nutrients in order to grow properly. And what was crucial is that pravastatin actually prevents the release of this crucial antiangiogenic molecule that was avoiding the formation of blood vessels in the placenta. 
And uh, you can see here, do you remember the dissoluble fluid molecule? That was the crucial molecule that quenches, sequesters this big jet that is necessary for the blood vessels. So now when we give probostatin, the values are not different from the control. While the complicated pregnancies, they have high levels of this antiangiogenic molecule. So we also prevented the kidney damage in these mice. Again, you can see how open is the light, the lumen of these vessels so that the plasma can really filter and the renal function can be normal. So I hope I convinced you that tissue factor increases uh, inflammation in this model uh, and that inflammation leads to placental injury, fetal death, and preeclampsia. And I showed you not so much in detail because of a matter of time, but the beneficial effects of statins in these mouse models of pregnancy complications. So we really found that statins are beneficial in mice in using these two mouse models of pregnancy complications. But now we want to see if we can prevent miscarriages in women using this treatment. So for this reason, we are in permanent contact with the FDA and with a group of colleagues in Yale University, in Leiden University, Edinburgh University, and the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And what was very exciting was to see that statins are not considered major teratogenic. Uh, Merck did what is called a post-marketing surveillance study, where, I mean, I'm very grateful to these women, but I can't figure out why they did it. There are 670 women that continue to take statins while pregnant, even if their doctors advise them not to do it. And they did it because actually there are no studies about that. But fortunately, they did not show any increase in teratogenicity when compared with the normal population. And moreover, the few teratogenic effects that were found did not follow a pattern. So that's what really happens in a in the general population. So based on that, we really started dreaming about a clinical trial. So uh, we are organizing this clinical trial with the purpose to evaluate the effectiveness of pravastatin. We picked pravastatin because it's hydrosoluble, so it's not going to get to the embryo. And we want to see if it can increase the live birth rate in couples who suffer from recurrent miscarriages with and without antiphospholipid antibodies. And we also want to evaluate the effectiveness of pravastatin in preventing preeclampsia. So uh, these are the organizations that gave us the money to do all this work, zillions and zillions of mice. These are my collaborators uh, who I'm really in depth with. And thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. I'm not a specialist, but um, these comments relate to the fact that March is Women's History Month. And when the Provost Lecture Series um, scheduled Dr. Girardi for uh, this time slot, I don't think we really uh, appreciated the important connection here. But I'm struck by uh, one of your quotes, which is, you find what you are looking for. And I think another way to phrase that is, you really don't get answers to a problem unless we ask the question in first place. Exactly, that's a better yeah. way to say. And, and your talk highlighted uh, the disparity in women's health care that's prevalent not only for pregnancies, but for other issues that have affected women's health. And pregnancy is something that many of us take for granted, but from what you were saying, um, we should not, because there are many factors that are, that are involved. But I was struck by, by what you said that really the health of a person throughout life has a lot to do with what goes on in utero. Yes. And, and that therefore <coughs> attention really um, should be paid to, to these issues. So I wanted to just reiterate the strong connection to Women's History Month. And also on, on campus, uh, <coughs> in another lecture series on um, this from from the School of Health, um, I don't know the exact sponsor, but they were talking about um, maternal mortality. <coughs> oh yeah, I went to that. And how that's a major issue too. Um, 
in underdeveloped countries, but unfortunately also in the United States. So this we talk really connects to that. So I want to thank you, not just for bringing this to us and to our attention, but for the research that you're doing. Thank you. Yes, that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what is called the in uterus programming, that is called also the, the Baker theory. It's uh, been described for many years now, and they are following those babies until adult life, and they found that really they have increased diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and uh, immune disease. So what happens in uterus is really important. <coughs> yes. Basically, Lee's research indicate that women that were previously anorexic uh, but were treated successfully for their anorexia, do they have a higher uh, miscarriage rate? I mean, I know that women that are anorexic, they have, uh, I don't have time to explain, but I really focus on the 50% of the women that do not find a cause for their miscarriages. The other 50% can be malformations or hormonal problems, the women that are anorexic, they have, they get into what is called over insufficiency. So they really have hormonal problems that affect uh, their fertility. Actually, they, the first time is that these young girls, unfortunately, they stop menstruating. So I guess that if you are recovered and your hormonal levels are normal, you might be able to carry a pregnancy to term. But uh, if you are at that stage of under malnutrition, I don't think uh, you will going to be able to. Yes, oh, how many questions? I love this. Yes, Anne? Uh, I have several questions. One is, what's happening to your mice exactly? What happens? The, the two mice that when you breed them together, uh, then there's an immune challenge such that... So we've been looking for that for a long time. And actually, that's why I actually resemble what happens in... In, in women, because really we don't know the cause. We know it's immune mediated. I didn't have time to show you because it happened the first time they made, but if you've made the mother a second time, she has a normal pregnancy. So that is showing that there's some sort of tolerance developing. If your question is what is activating the complement system, we don't know. There's not an HMMC mismatch or anything. Yes, and actually we are doing studies to uh, APL antibodies. They not only affect the growth of the babies, but they can really get into their nervous system. Patients with lupus, they, can, they have what is called uh, CNS lupus or central nervous system lupus. So we are studying these babies to see if they are normal. So we are doing behavior studies and they are, I mean, we measure memory, anxiety and fear, and they seem to be okay. Okay, because I guess my question, what I was wondering is, whether that would be a normal system for the mother to reject a baby that is not working well? Not oh, that happens, definitely. Like a, that's not what you're no, looking at. No, that's not what that's I'm... That's just a rejection from the mother. That exactly. has nothing to do with the viability of the baby. Exactly. Yes. yes. My question was sort of related to that, but I was more interested in... I found it sort of very interesting because there was a, I know I'm, I, I read an article before where, and I, I, I'm from nursing, so nursing is my background, mm -hmm. and um, there, there are some women who have basically like an allergic reaction to their husband's sperms, and so oh, they better have a problem conceiving, and I thought as I listened to you that this mm -hmm. was directly related it's, to It's an immune really reaction. Cool. To, um, <coughs> yes, there are even some treatments. I don't know the results yet, but there's a clinical trial where they immunize the mother with paternal cells, paternal T cells that are part of these um, army of uh, cells that defend us. Yes, definitely. And my other um, comment, I think, is that it's really fascinating what you're doing because my sister actually had very bad um, preeclampsia. And um, 30 years later now, her kidneys actually are damaged. And um, I think 30 years ago, no one realized just how damaging um, preeclampsia was to women and, and the fact that they needed to follow them. Oh, you definitely. Know, there, high blood pressure there are new studies showing that, yeah, the cardiovascular disease in women with preeclampsia is increased. And you'd be surprised to hear that the women, the number of women that develop preeclampsia is equivalent to the number of women that are diagnosed with breast cancer a year. 
So and, that, the, and, that it and it's the in, main cause for a woman to die during pregnancy. And that it does run in families, and now my oh, niece also um, ended up with that. And if you have a preeclamptic uh, pregnancy, you have a 70% chances of developing in your next one. So that's why in our clinical trial, our focus was going, is going to be women that they already have a preeclamptic or two prior to the trial. And also, if you have a miscarriage, your, in your second pregnancy, you have a 30% probability of having a miscarriage, and in the third one, it raises up to 80%. Yes? For the women who took statins, and these women, they took studies, actually, I didn't have time to explain, but for cardiovascular problems. So they didn't measure? Uh, I mean, they, did, they only were looking for cardiovascular uh, effects. What is very interesting is that if you think about a woman taking a statins in their fertile years, someone around their 30s that is taking statins has to have a very serious vascular problem, like diabetes or hypertension or obesity. And those women are per se susceptible to have bad pregnancy outcomes. And actually, they had normal pregnancy. So that really gave me the idea that maybe this is the, the treatment. And, and instead of statins, is anyone looking at uh, creating a mimic for the, C, the C5A receptor? Oh, yeah. The complement inhibitors is another uh, story. The only problem is that there's only one complement inhibitor in the, in the market now that is called Ekuluximab. It's a C5 inhibitor. It's in phase three, but it's only used for PNH, that is paroxytic nocturnal hemoglobinuria. It's also a, uh, a vascular disease. And so far, it's not working that great. And so they are not really in the market. So that's when we found this literature about the studies. I mean, it's something that has been used for the last 18 years. So there are a lot of studies. Not that many in women, because unfortunately, most of the FDA studies are made in Males, Caucasian, 30 years old. So women are a kind of neglected population when it comes to, to therapies. That's the problem that we are facing. We don't know about the biodistribution. Some of the, uh, we are managing certain doses that we might use because there are no studies in women. Yes? In response to that comment, and Laura, your comment about it being Women's History Month, just for those who are unaware, in NIH studies that involve the PI must address the inclusion of women. Mm -hmm. And if they're not included, if they're excluded, there must be a justification for why that's the case. Yeah, that's part of an era one uh, proposal. It has the inclusion of children and women, actually. When was that instituted? Oh, that was around five years ago. Not, oh. Yeah, not before then. Yeah, it's a very risk. Yes. Uh, or maybe five. less than five. More than Let's five, see. But I don't um, but, but not more than 10. I no, think. definitely not. That's like amazing. Yes. And children. Women and children. And that's why you don't know, I mean, yeah. even these women, the dose of heparin they use is empirical. They don't know. And if you think about the, the increase in the volume and the volume of distribution of a woman, I mean, it can double. In a mouse, at least, it's 45% more the extracellular volume than in a non-pregnant mouse. So all the parameters are really moved, but we don't know that. And those actually are protected. And it makes sense, because the inflammatory cells, they release those factors, B and D. So that can create what is called an amplification loop. And so after the inflammation occurs, then they can still release complement, activate the complement cascade, and bring in more inflammatory cells. Yes, I'm just saying that preventing the feeding through the lactin pathway is not changed. No, the lactin pathway doesn't. The other way around, if you were to have too much ah, the you pathway, add. I mean, I am not, I mean, if anything that you can activate complement, I mean, and, and, and the, you have all these very important defense mechanisms to block complement activation. If you overcome that protection, you are definitely going to induce a miscarriage. Yes. So what kind of, you're the expert, what kind of diet can be that? <laughs> and it would be really interesting to see people like in certain parts of the world that they eat this or that if they, they, they have an increased or absorption rate or I mean an epidemiology study would be great. But I mean I'm totally ignorant about the, the, uh, the nutrition part. Some people based on the blood type are so to speak allergic to certain foods. Uh -huh. 
and they're persistently in those schools and they come down with a lot of problems. I have a second question along similar lines, which when I'm directing it to you, also to Dr. Jack Jackman. And that question is, uh, here's a for instance. If you have a, a woman who is say type A, the type A, mm -hmm. and say the husband is a type B, so they could not mutually have blood transfusions. No, that, that's one of the cases of, that is called RH uh, uh, mismatch. Not RH. And they what? immunize the mother before, but it's not of the A and the B actually. It has to do with being positive or negative for yeah. the, the serotype. Well, I want to go in a slightly different direction apart from RH. What if they were both secretors in the Lewis secretor system where they would have antibodies, like the nurse mentioned, the woman being allergic to her husband's sperm because the secretors have antibodies in all of their body mm -hmm. Well, that definitely has to be in this 50% category that is immune-mediated and we don't know. I didn't read anything about the blood type. What I've been reading, actually, been reviewing an article that I found interesting, is that there are some women that they have antibodies against the Y chromosome, and they actually miscarried only boys. I mean, the, the work needs to be to do a little more work, but uh, it's a work from Scandinavia, so I was surprised to see that. So it's an immune reaction, and actually that doesn't allow the, ba the boys, the baby boys, to uh, go to town. So definitely, if there's some sort of immune uh, problem in any of them, definitely. And that's why also these women with lupus, even if they don't have antiphospholipid antibodies, they have problems during pregnancy. Pregnancy is the challenge of your immunity. And that's why these women, they flare. They have all these skin and joint problems while pregnant because of the immunity that, in a way, is exacerbated during pregnancy. Yes, you have a question. What are the demographics of the, um, the statin population? Do you have to replicate that in the clinical trials? Oh, well, that's what we are kind of uh, fighting about uh, with the FDA. The FDA has an unfortunate classification of the drugs, that is the A, B, C, D, X. For them, the studies are category X, but that's the worst one, but it's just because there are no studies. No women have been included in any of these trials. But the FDA are confident after the Merck study that actually studies are not teratogenic. But uh, the group, this group of 770 uh, women that take, so they take it as, as a good sign. So, so far what we are trying to negotiate is the time when we are going to give the studies. So there's an idea of to start with the pregnancy, omitting this crucial window of, organ of, of organogenesis that is the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Though I, ha I have to say that in, according to the, my studies, I think it's too late for that. But that would be a first thing to do. The second thing we are doing is in the UK, women that decided to have a, 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 an abortion, um, sometimes they collaborate with this trial. So now we're going to see if they, there are many already, that they agreed to take statins for four weeks before getting the abortion and try to see if there are any effects on that. I mean, that's something that I guess that only in the UK they can think about it, but um, I mean, um, that is going to really give a lot of uh, information about, uh, but I mean, 670 and the malformations are really not different from the general population. Um, not actually. Uh, I can give you the site. I mean, it's a Merck paper in epidemiology, actually. Uh, one was done in, and there's another one with a smaller group of 150, and they're French women, Caucasian women. Um, this group, actually, they don't make reference to the, um, it's just interesting that actually these women, if they have to t be taking statins, they must, their health must be really uh, a problem. I mean, for a wo woman in their 30s or 20s to be taking statins, you have to have a really high cholesterol or being diabetic or have a serious cardiovascular problem. Yes. No more questions? Thank you very much.